So hi everyone, thank you for watching. Today I'm with legendary professional boxer Monte Barrett, who was the WBA heavyweight world title challenger and fought a who's who list of professional boxing legends in his career, not limited to David Hay, Vladimir Klitschko, Jimmy Thunder, David Tua, twice, uh, Nikolai Valuev, and a whole host more uh, during his career from 1996 to 2014. And today we're going to be having a chat about Monty's life and career. So, uh, like I said before, thank you for thank you for taking the time uh, to talk to me. I appreciate that very much, Cam. Oh yeah, thank you. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so yeah, like like I was saying before, um, let's have a chat about some of your proudest moments in your career because obviously in your career. Uh, you had a lot of fights, you know, you, you're uh, a legend in boxing, you know, you fought, like I said, who's who list, um, right. the best in the world. Is there one moment for you that is like the proudest moment in your career? Um, maybe there's not just one, maybe there's more than one, I don't know. Um, but what, you know, what comes to mind when I sort of say proudest moment for you? So I would, it's, it's, so, it's so many, I have a few like moments that uh, even fights I didn't win was proud, like, you know, the value of fight, you know. I went out on my shell, but Don King is a is a is the grand manipulator of all. So what he did was he a lot of people don't know this. So the the WB all sanction bodies have a um a rule that they can have a minimum or maximum ring size. Don King wanted to make value of bigger than life. So what he did was he he got the ring to be the smallest size. So it was supposed to be a 20, 20 inch ring, 20 foot ring. It wanted to be in a 14 by three quarters of a ring. So I'm fighting a giant in a seven foot two ring. And when he went over over the top rope to get in, he was in my corner. So my, my trainer, James Ali Bashir, looked at me and said, game plan is thrown out the window. You got to fight this guy head up. And it was like, I had to, I had no choice, but I had some real defining and good moments. I had some fighting three uh, young undefeated fighters, all three back to back, Joe Messi, Dominique Gwynn and Owen Beck. And uh, that was, those were defining moments, you know, and defining fights for me as well, you know? So I got so many, so many um, to go through even early in my career. But nevertheless, to say that I'm glad that I'm in two pieces. Now, you know, they said one piece, but I'm in two pieces. You know, I still got I still got my, my wits and my sense. So I'm happy about that, you know. Absolutely. And there's something else here. I mean, you, you've probably um, talked about this before because people throw around about toughest fights, don't they? But out of all the fights you had, um, I mean, obviously, it's well known that you had a lot of heart and uh, everything like that. But I've got to right. say, what, of all the people you fought, was there one that was like the toughest or was it maybe more than one? Or, yeah, um... it was a few. It was a, I, I got a handful of tough fights because um, as fighters, we are taught to not be emotional, right? So that's one of the hardest things to do when you're in there, you know, trying to kill somebody and they're trying to kill you. So one of the toughest mental, most emotional fights I've had was with Eric Kirkland. I don't know if anybody even know who Eric Kirkland is, but he was an upcoming heavyweight. His fought his trainer was from the UK. And this kills he was from Brooklyn. He had the heaviest hands in boxing that I've ever witnessed in my life. So I was uh, off for like two years. I had a hiatus going through some promotional things. And um, I came back on ESPN to fight Eric Kirkland, who was going to fight Joe Messi next. They had already signed the contract. That's how I got a chance to fight Joe Messi. So from the very first round, he cut me. He cut me three in three different places in my face, in my mouth, and over my eye. And every punch he hit me with, I wanted to quit. I don't know if it was so hard because I wasn't fighting for two years. And it was like every punch he hit hurt like hell. But I wound up stopping him in the 10th round. That was a very mental and emotional fight because I was playing with so many, I wanted to quit so many times in my head, but every time he hit me harder, I was like, I can't let this guy do it. You know, every time I look for somewhere to lay down, he reminded me that I got to stand up, you know? So that was a very uh, mental and emotional fight for me. And um, I have, I have probably a dozen of them, but I mean, no, not, not a dozen, but at least five 
Value Wealth was meant to, Vladimir Klitschko was meant to, Hasim Rockman was meant to. So those fights was all meant to fights for me and very hard fights emotionally and psychologically. Okay. Now you've touched on something there, Champ, which is, you know, the, the mental um, aspect of fighting, which isn't always talked about as much as, you know, the physical preparation. But right. I mean, going into fights, though, I mean, it's one thing I'm curious about. At the level that, you know, you were fighting at throughout your career, what was your mental um, preparation for going into a big fight or going into any fight, really? I mean, what was sort of going through your mind on the run up to, to fights? Well, um, another fight I, I left out was the Ty Phil's fight. That was a very mental fight. It wasn't emotional because I didn't have you no know, attachment to um, Ty Phil's. But when I fought Hasim Rockman, like, um, was a mental fight because we were good friends. We, uh, had, we celebrated the 4th of July with our families together. You know, the next thing you know, we're fighting, you know. So the aspect of it was, you know, um, I don't know if it was Holyfield or Mike Tyson. I think it was Holyfield who told me. He said, um, he said, the day that you get attached to a fight, you know, is the day that you lose. You got to approach it like uh, clocking in and out of a job. Because, you know, us men, we do not go on, on our emotions. Once we react on an emotion, you know, we lose it. You know, we're not like women are very like women, men are ego, women are emotional. So we can't, we can't do what women do, you know? So when he told me that I didn't understand it, this was in like 96 when me and Zab Judah was at his training camp, hanging out with him and we was with the Duvas. But I got it as I got older, you know, that every fight that I really lost was basically an emotional fight that I let my emotions get the best of me. David Hay, Hasim Rockman, Nikolo Valuev, Vladimir Klitschko. It was nerves of emotions of fear, of doubt, of anger, of, you know, disrespect. All those emotions run through your head when you're fighting somebody that you know that is all, you know, all or nothing. Yeah. Which does lead me to, you know, another point with that is obviously in your career, you know, you've won big and you've, you know, reached like the, you know, the top of the mountain basically, but you've also, you know, lost key fights and, you, and you've done a bit of everything, you know. And one of the things that, that strikes me about that is because you've sort of done it all. How do you bounce back from adversity? Because, you, you know, you've been in situations where you've lost key fights, where you've even lost, you know, back to back and things like that. But then you know, you've bounced back, you've kept going. And, you know, and that's a very, very admirable thing, I would say. But how do you, um, how did you bounce back from, you know, those types of hardships, basically? Well, I think I bounced back because of my strong will and my desire not to lose, to not quit. You know, I have, I have met a lot of people in my life. And one word that sticks with me with a lot of different people is blessings and relentless. Right. So relentless is a strong word for me because it shows you my character, my true form, whether I'm doing a business deal or whether I'm getting to know somebody. But I have a relentless um, uh, approach like I, I didn't I will uh, refuse to be denied. So, you know, being a champion is not being undefeated. It's about learning from your defeats more. For me, I'm learning more lessons in my defeats than my victories. Right. So I have taken that upon myself to be able to capitalize off of something. So when I, I lost I, for a few years, I was losing, you know, I just was. Um, but I was at the end of my career and I didn't have that much backing. I, I couldn't have the proper training, you know. So when you when now I'm like getting in that journeyman stage, which I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. That's why after uh, the Lewis Ortiz fight, don't forget about that. I was like, you know. It was under his promotion in Golden Boy. And I got hit with a good shot. And um, I got, I took a knee. And everybody knows me, referees and officials. I'll take a knee and I get back up and I come fighting harder. And um, Ortiz was a strong guy at the time. I was training with uh, Thomas Adamac, which, you know, I was helping him get ready for a fight. But at the same time that, you know, that relentless about me, I wanted to just go, go, go. And the referee stopped the fight. And that's when I realized that, you know what, it's time to pass the torch. You know, it's time to, like, you know, just just give it a rest. It's time to leave the game in, on that competing stage and go to another level. So, you know, I would say, like, for me, it's just like uh, the relentless thing. 
just pursuing something with uh with the urge and with the with energy to to uh be the best absolutely uh, it's it's fantastic to hear you know that side of it because it, it's the side you don't always get from you know just watching the fights and it's it's good to see that you know the human side of um what the fighters go through themselves and on the subject of that, I mean, I would like to talk about um, a few key fights, you know, of yours. And, and obviously, you know, you've had too many for us to talk about them all, um, and you know, really. But I'd like to talk about a few of the key ones. And obviously, I'd like to start with Klitschko, because obviously, um, legend in the sport. I mean, you fought him uh, a little bit earlier in his career in, mm -hmm. in the UK, uh, which is mm -hmm. the other reason I bring that up, obviously, for the people in the UK watching this. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, how did that fight go down? I mean, what was the experience like? And, you know, what, what was it like fighting him? I, I don't really have one question about it. I'm just opening up for the whole um, experience of what you experienced fighting him in the build up to the fight and the actual fight itself. Well, when I fought Krishka, we were both young. It was in 2000. It was on, uh, it was on Lennox Lewis and uh, Francois, both uh, on the card. We was the co-feature. And I was in training camp. This is a lot of people don't know this. I was in training camp. And Lennox Lewis had let me use his training camp. I wasn't his sparring partner, but I would spar with him from time to time. And I didn't, I was, I should have had a little bit more respect for Lennox. You know what I'm saying? Considering he was the champ, the dethroning champ at, uh, the, uh, at that time. And every time we boxed and the man you put us in, it was a war. And I left all my fight in the, in the gym. Because I'm sitting up here trying to prove I got balls to the champ, the heavyweight champ of the world, the best of the best at the time. And, you know, I mean, it was it was like we was, we was, you know, he got the best of, of it, of course. But, I mean, I was in his ass. And, we was, you know, it was some, some, some days he was bleeding, some days I was bleeding. But when I say he got the best of it because he's bigger, he's more experienced. But my heart was just as big as his. But Emmanuel said, uh, we, we boxed 22 rounds. And Emmanuel said, enough. He said, you're not going to have nothing left for the fight, you know, and which was true. I left all my fight in the gym because then we start bringing spawn partners in and I was knocking everybody out. So in like one and two rounds. So, but I really needed that work from Lennox with that experience because Klitschko was just like Lennox, but, you know, he wasn't as good, but he's tall, he rangy and those things. So, um, you know, so a lot of people don't know like the backdrop. So the backdrop was, I, w I lost the fight in the gym. So, and then the second thing was when I went to, U that was my first time going to London. And I've been all other places, but I've never been to London. The food didn't agree with me. Everything was horrible. And then, you know, I didn't go on the right time. I, you know, I, I went and I was on, I was on you guys, not on you guys' time, but my time there. You know what I mean? So my trainer said, whatever you do, when we get there in the morning, do not go to sleep until it's time to go to sleep at night. And I went to sleep and I never adjusted to you uh, to the time. So I was up all night with diarrhea and it was horrible. And the weather was, was, was gloomy. Everything was bad. But so London is not one of my favorite places, but I love the people there because they showed me a lot of love. But as far as just the performance, it went downhill. And uh, Klitschko was a, he was a strong young lion, even though he hit me on a break and, and dropped me with a, a left hook, which was, he should have had a point taken away from him. But, you know, he's Klitschko. I spent a lot of time with him, like, years later in 2006 in, um, uh, in Spain. He asked me to come and help him work, work out and be a spa partner. And I wound up working out with him and Manny. And uh, they used me, like, for the end of the spa because he was knocking all his spa partners out. But I got a chance to meet him and spend time with him. You know, we meet, we all know each other, but spend time with a person, you get to have a different relationship. And he's a hell of a guy. He's a great guy, him and his brother. Now let's talk about another, um, you know, another UK fight. I mean, let's talk about David Hay. Um, um, I just want to, I want to get that one in there. And one of the reasons is that obviously, um, when we spoke on the phone, uh, you know, the other day, you, you mentioned about that. And it's, uh, and it's interesting to hear that perspective. So let's talk a little bit about David Hay and, and a little bit about that fight. Any aspect of it that you want to talk about? Um, how did that whole situation go down with that fight? Well, David Hay is the king of manipulation. You know, I got to tap my hat off to him because he he definitely has, he won the, the one fight before we even got in the ring. You know, I told you that we talked about it briefly, but I mean, so uh, it was his first heavyweight fight and it was a great uh, match for the both of us because he's a former light 
cruiserweight champion, and now he's fighting a, a, a gatekeeper. And um, and that fight was going to catapult one of us to, to a title fight. But I got so emotionally involved in the fight. Everything my promoter, Lou DiBella, had kind of threw me under the bus because uh, I found out some things that wasn't that wasn't uh, good for on my side. So basically, instead of me having um, protection when I went there, I basically went there with my trainer, you know, uh, um, RIP to Jimmy Glenn. He just passed away of coronavirus. Me and Jimmy went out there for two and a half weeks. We went out there. We, we were supposed to fly first class. We, fly, we flew business class. Okay, that's okay. When we get to the um, airport, we have no body there to pick us up. So mind you, we spent $400 a car for a cab. We get, to, we get to the, we get, we get. <laughs> this is crazy. We get to the, um. We're supposed to stay at the Crown Plaza. We wind up staying at some rinky dink hotel across over the water, some Hilton Inn, Holiday Inn, some little spot where all the fans were staying for the fight. We stay in this little room, me and Jimmy together. The room was like around 200 square feet. Right. So me and him is, we bust up this room for two and a half weeks. We don't have no food. They didn't give us, they supposed they gave me like five, uh, 5,000 pounds when I came there or whatever it was. They gave me no money. I had no way to train. I had to, I had to pay for a cab to go back and forth to the gym. I had to pay for my own food. I was just so pissed off at David Hay and this promotion and nobody got back to me. We tried reaching out for them for all that time until the end, Adam, I think uh, David Hay's trainer at the time and manager, <laughs> He, he got in contact with me the week of the fight. I was so livid. I wanted to punch him in the face. But they won the war. They won the psychological war. A lot of people do not understand. It's not just a battle, a physical battle. It's a mental, emotional, psychological battle that you're in, you know? And if you don't understand what boxing is like, it's not just what you see. So... David Hay, I had to tap my hat off to him because he is definitely a king manipulator. And it worked. He had me so, I bust my ass trying to get in the ring. <laughs> you know, everybody thought I was thinking I was Chris Nassim or whatever. You know, I checked the ropes earlier. They was kind of tight. But, you know, by the time I went to fight him, I was hyper. And, you know, all this adrenaline. And next thing you know, I jump over the ropes and it was loose. And boom, I bust my ass. But nevertheless, to say, you know, you know, those are the lessons in boxing. So that's my David Hayes story. Okay. Well, again, I mean, it's fantastic to hear, you know, that side of it, even though it, it doesn't sound like the best experience. I'm oh, just saying. But I got to tell you, um, this is crazy. This is, I forgot to even tell, because his, his, uh, his, his friend wrote a book. It's his brother-in-law. And he, 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 he opposed as a, a reporter, and he befriended me just to get my scoops. But I really didn't tell him too much, but you know, it was, you know, just I'm training. And you know, but it was David Hay got him to suck him on, like he got him on me. And it was his, it was, I just saw him like a few months ago in um in New, um, New Jersey. And he said, my, my, my job was to see what was going on in your training camp. So I posed as a, a train, as, as a reporter to figure out what was going on with you. So, he covered all bases. Like, you know, some fighters, uh, you know, I'm just going to train. He didn't just train. He covered my mental part. He covered my physical part and my psychological part. And, you know, I had to tap my hat off to him, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing, uh, you know, the length that he went to there for that. It's, it's, it's quite something to, to hear about. Um, one of the other fights that, that obviously I do want to talk about Um is obviously a world title challenge. Um, I mean, and I know it didn't go, you know, necessarily your way, but it was, um, it's an amazing achievement to obviously be in there um, for the world title, even against a guy like that. But Valuev, I mean, obviously, you know, the size of him, um, you know, seven feet tall and uh, however much he weighed at that time, over, over 300 pounds and everything. I mean, what was it like going up against... Um, a guy like that, did it did it affect you at all? Did did the sort of um, hype around? Because you mentioned earlier about Don King making out to be bigger than life and uh, all the rest of it. But what was that whole experience like um, fighting fighting him fighting Valuev? Well, first I had I had a, I know you you missed it, but I had a um I had a title of defense before Valuev, 
that was the for the interim of the WBC between yes. me and Hasi. Yeah. Then I got the second value up. But fighting value up, it was like I spent a lot of time with him before the fight. Like we spent time at HBO doing promotion for the fight. So, you know, I was like, you know, sizing him up and I had a good training camp. And I thought I was well prepared, but you know, we, we trained in a twenty foot ring. So when the ring was cut, you know, six, six more foot and it was through six and three quarters, I mean, the ring was 14 and three quarters. That was a lot. That was a lot for me. So um, mentally, I was like kind of tapped out. And Don King, you know, being Don King, you know, what he do? He gave me an extra $10,000. Oh, everything's going to be all right. Then give me another, some more money, some more money. But I, I, had, I had already committed to the fight, you know, and they, he sprung that on me the day of the fight that their ring was being cut short. So um, that was, a, that was a, a letdown. And then I had a whole bunch of baby mama drama. <laughs> so if you know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. I had, I, had my, my, I had my son's mother and then my wife was at the fight and it was a whole bunch of mess. So that wasn't, that didn't happen out, you know? But for the most part, um, Value F wasn't even a puncher. He wasn't, he wasn't an impressive guy at all. It was just that I had, that was the first time I ever had a severe concussion. I had eight knots on my head and I had to stay overnight in the emergency room. So he wasn't a big puncher, but he was punching down and he was coming forward. And you see David Hay uh, hurt him pretty bad, won the WBA. You know? I thought I probably could have done the same thing if I would have had more room or more space, but I just was, uh, I just kind of, you know, fell apart with this, with having no space, basically. Okay. And a couple more, I, I just want to talk about a couple more fights. Um, and I mean, I'd love to talk about them all, but obviously, get, you know, given everything you've accomplished, um, I, I need to get on to some of the motivational stuff. But there's a couple of other fights I want to talk about. And one of them is, um, uh, going back a little bit in time, is, is a Tim Witherspoon, um, your defeat, which is obviously uh, an amazing win. Because I know I've talked about a couple of big fights here that didn't go your way. And I want to talk about a couple, um, uh, you know, of your, of your best wins, you know. Um, and I know you had a lot of good wins, but again, I've just picked a few out of there. So, so Tim Witherspoon, you know, your defeat of him, um, amazing achievement, uh, absolutely amazing fight. I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about that one and a little bit about um, what you experienced um, with that one, what, you know, how you, how you feel about your performance uh, now looking back on, on that fight. And again, just anything you want to say um, to that, really. Yeah, well, Tim Witherspoon, he was, for one, he's a great guy. He's one hell of a guy. He's one of my favorite guys in boxing because he's always happy, you know, you know, and that's another thing, just resilience and perseverance, you know. He's most most fighters have been chopped down financially and emotionally, but we still pick up the pieces. We still keep going. So fighting Tim Witherspoon, we were supposed to fight in Atlanta City a month before, six weeks before. That didn't happen, and they postponed it to the Layla Ali, uh, Jackie Frazier undercard at a uh, Turning Stone, which was a great event as well. So, fighting him, it was an emotional thing. I fought him, and you have heard of the the basketball player Stephon Marbury. Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I, I trained his projects in Brooklyn with Andre Rozier, and it was like it was like the rats and the roaches. It was like the the gutter gutter. I had to go back and you know, dig deep and find something because I know Tim had a big right hand. I knew that he had a lot of experience in him being a former heavyweight champion himself. And he still was knocking people out left and right, you know. Uh, even though I caught him later on in his career, he still, you know, the last thing to go on a fighter is his power. So he was very strong, very dangerous. And, um, you know, I was concerned. I was concerned more for him because of his resume then I would be concerned for uh, a Dominic Gwynn, you know, because of Tim's resume and his sneaky right hand. Okay, but how did it feel to you know to get the um, get the win against uh, you know another legendary fighter like that? I mean, were, you know, were you happy with your performance overall in that fight, or what? What are your mm. thoughts on that side of it? No, I wasn't happy. I was. It was more of a street fight for me, like a mental, like a will, uh, you know, a. Uh, uh, um, uh, a matter of, you know, your, what they call it, mind over matter. 
like that type of thing because I'm I feel like honestly I feel like God put me on this earth for a purpose right my purpose is not to be a loser I feel like I have a defined purpose to be a winner whether I lose or win in the ring that still doesn't define me but define me is how I react if I win or if I lose right so I feel like a winner all the time even when things are down on me in my personal life I feel like a winner and so I feel like I'm supposed to, whatever happened to me, God ordained it to happen. My wins, my losses in boxing, it's not, but those things don't make me, that, those are part of my story, right? To be able to help somebody, even to probably to help myself, probably for me to dig deep within myself and say what I could have, what I could have done better. Like some of my big losses, the Brahassin Rockman fight, I almost got locked up the, the, the day of the fight. A lot of people don't even know. My same crazy son's mother, she was, I brought, I brought my, my, uh, my um, fiance to the fight and she just kind of lost it on me, you know, and, and, but that was on me because like my thing was, you know, trying to please everybody. And you can't make everybody happy. Don King told me something that, that I hold to me to this day. Don King is a ruthless businessman, but he's great for the sport of boxing. He, and he, he, he has helped a lot of people, but he robbed more people. But he told me, the best thing you can do for yourself is get your shit together. And it makes sense. I mean, we was arguing, going back and forth, and it was some words that we were saying that wasn't pleasing to neither one of us. But that was the bottom line story. The best thing you could do for anybody is get your shit together. So, you know, for me, that's, that's, that's how I, t I kind of take it, you know? So, you know, so for winning is about, it's, it's, it's a purpose, it's a drive. It's not feeling like, okay, I lost, I wanna, I wanna quit boxing. It's like, no, pick up the pieces, you know, dust the, dust the, dust the, the, um, the dirt off the and keep it moving, you know, and keep it moving. So that's how, that's how I take it. Absolutely. So we've talked about a few different fights here and, and, and everything, and I'm actually going to open this up differently than how I planned because, you know, we, we've talked about a mix. Uh, I'd like to talk about David Tua, but before we get to that, what, what do you feel is your um, best win in your career? Because, um, I mean, I know I've touched on a few, you know, amazing fights that didn't go your way and things like that, but which fighter that you beat are you most proud of? I mean, you mentioned, um, or oh, in back earlier, you mentioned Dominic Quinn, you, you know, uh, obviously both unbeaten, but I mean, for you, what, what is your, your best win um, that, you, that you're most sort of happy with and most proud of in that way? Wow, my best wins. Well, I have, I have about three of them. So my best win would be, of course, um, my, my first, um, my, 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 all right, Greg Page was my first best win, you know, he was a he was a you know he was an old older guy, but he had like I think he had 18 wins in a row or something like that. I think it was uh, 16 wins in a row, and he was very experienced. And that was my first main event fight, and um, under um the, um, the Goose, Dan Goosen and uh, America Presents. Another good win was uh, my first title against Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson just fought Lennox Lewis. He was a strong guy from Florida, a bulky guy who can punch. That was another good win. Uh, um, and then I would go, you know, I, I cut all other wins out and I go to David Tour because it's the beginning. It's the beginning and it's the ending, right? So the beginning was uh, on Greg Page. And, you know, and then I fought Phil Jackson. That was the beginning. That was my first title fight. And then I fought David Tua, my you know my last hurrah, and I was, and I was later on in my career, and I trained like a beast. I was so I was so sold and so invested into that winning that fight, but I knew I would beat David Tua any day of the week, any time. His style made great for me, so I was offered a fight to fight David Tua, um, in two thousand in two thousand yeah two thousand. 2001, I was offered a fight, but I was on, I was on a, I, I had um, stopped boxing for two years. And uh, my promoter, who had a uh, name, Joe DeGuardia, we was going through contract disputes. He was underpaying me, whatever. 
But I knew I could be David Tua any day of the week. His style was just made for me. So um, David Tua is a great win. Both fights were defining fights. And, and you know, I should have stopped fighting after 2011, after, this, after the, um, the second fight. But I kept going because it was like I just had a, I had a different approach. And it wasn't the best approach. I felt like I was um, being so selfish or you know, self-centered. Because sometimes it's good to be selfish because you got to take care of yourself first, right? But I was being self-centered, and I wanted to get my just dues. But David Tua was like at one hell of a fight. I mean, the guy broke my jaw in the last round um, uh, with, with like 35, 40 seconds left. And he dropped me in the 12th round, and I dropped him in the 12th round in the first fight. It was such a coincidence, right? But he dropped me. I fell out the ring and had to roll back in. And he was strong from round one to round 12. He can punch. This guy, he, he can knock a mule out. He can punch. I mean, he probably is one of the hardest punches besides Klitschko was a hard puncher. David Hay, Hasin Rockman was a hard puncher, but he had big, heavy, solid hands. And um, Eric Kirkman. Those guys are punches. So yeah, so um, David Tua. But I mean, you know, with with David Tua, I mean, how did it feel to actually get the win? Because I know the first fight obviously was was a draw, or well, controversially was was a draw. Um, you knocked him down, and you mentioned that. But then later on, when you came back, when you know, when you got the win um, against another all-time great like that, I mean, that must have been a good feeling, right? It was a great feeling because I know he admitted the best feeling is in the locker room after the second fight, he admitted that I won the first fight. So I think that was like, that's all I need to hear him say. You know, we all, we all, I used to go to watch him fight all the time and go in the back, back room and talk to him when he fought in New York. And we, we was promoted by Cedric Kushner at the same time. So it wasn't like, we all got mad love for each other. All the fighters got respect and love for one another, especially knowing what we do. It's hard. It's hard taking this uh, taking this assignment, but um, yeah. So it was a it was an amazing opportunity and fighting him, and you know uh, the guy was like he was a he was a mule. But what made the second fight harder for me was going overseas. And then David Tua did something that he did for the first fight. He he uh, lost a lot of weight and he wanted to look good for the scale, but that's not all. That doesn't always work. Looking like a, a key, uh, like a he man, and all cut up and muscles. That's that's not good. So the second fight, he came back looking like David Tua, you know, just with his strength and his power. Because the scale, you'll lose a fight on the scale trying to look like you know, like a Superman. You know, it's not for everybody. So like I said, but David Tua, he was a hell of a person. Um, the second fight for me was glorifying because I I defeated him for the titles in his own country. So, but the first fight for me was like my baby. Like, I got to take that with me all the way through. Brilliant. So let's, you know, let, one of the things I want to talk about here is, which I touched on earlier, a little bit about the mentality side of things. But I'd like to talk about what it is that um, has actually made you such a successful person in life. And what I mean by that is... Um, to make it to the level, you know, that you've performed that uh, in your career and consistently performed that, you know, take something special. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's got to take something special. I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of fighters that don't, you know, ever get to the level that you got to and, and so forth. And where I'm sort of going with this is what would you say um, about yourself separates you from uh, from the rest? You know, I mean, how I mean, you know, what were some of the key factors that allowed you to succeed? Uh, in terms of, you know, your character, in terms of qualities that you possess um, personally, if, if that makes sense. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm asking. It makes a lot of sense. So I think some of the qualities that I have in myself is that I've always had like a guardian angel. I know this is like a spiritual thing, but this is me, right? So I can tell you, be honestly, be vulnerable. I've always felt like somebody was looking over me, right? I've always had great balance in my life, even as a kid even through all the horrific things that have happened to me, right? I've always, I've never been a, a, a troublemaker. I've never been, um, never been, I never did things out of malicious or just out of malice to hurt or harm people. I've always had a good balanced spirit, you know? And um, I think I've just been blessed, you know, um, throughout my life and through, you know, situations like, you know, in a car accident, you know, being in a coma for a month, 
almost do some of my life, you know, uh, puncture lung, punk, you know, broken ribs, hit, uh, uh, ear cut off, all these things, you know, meningitis when I was a kid, I was in the hospital for months. All these things and just a guardian angel looking over me. I've been in street wars. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy from the streets who learned how to box. I'm not a boxer who lived in the streets. Like I've basically lived the life of a street person. And I do, did do all of that. I went to high school, graduated high school, went to college. I was in college uh, going on my second year when I got involved in boxing. You know, I've taken care of people. I've done so many things for my community and for people. So when I look at everything and, and see how balanced I am, and now me being in Christ and, you know, being a born again Christian, you know, it's a life that God planned for me and it's just designed for me. I can't explain it. Some things are unexplainable. I just think that, you know, they said, you know, you walk by faith is about, um, you know, life is about faith and how my heart is. My heart is in the right place, right? If anybody called me, I give them a chair off my back. I have done so many things not to talk about, but as far as me and God, as far as helping people, as far as, you know, having my, my presence in, in a place where I can, be, I can manifest goodness, you know, and be, you know, I don't hold grudges. I don't have, I don't have any negative things like, you know, I go through things like many people do, but my approach is like, you know, it's, it's more than one day. It's not the last day keep moving, keep pushing, it's going to get better. And, you know, and that's what I firmly believe. So to answer my question, I, to answer your question, I don't really know. I play basketball, I play football, I play baseball, I box, I sold drugs when I was a kid. You know, I beat people up. You know, I was like, I was, I was the biggest guy out of my whole little crew, but everybody wanted to beat me up because I was the biggest, but I was the youngest. So everybody figured, you know, we beat the big guy up, everybody had run. And that's before it was all these gangs and all this other stuff involved. But I, I never was, you know, I never did the gang thing. I'm not, I'm not into that. But I had a little crews. I had five, six of my friends that we grew up with. Like the lean on me, like the kids grew up since fourth, fifth grade, and they go all the way to high school together, right? Like that. But at the end of the day, I just think that I'm, you know, I'm a balanced person, you know, and uh, I have God's favor all over my life. That's it. Yeah. That's a that's a fantastic insight into um into the mindset that's going on there. And I really like where you're coming from with that. Uh and I and I relate on a number of levels as well. But it is it's a fantastic to to get that out there. Um so thank you for that, champ. Uh, and it does lead me to another another point that sort of follows on from that, I guess, is that if you were to give um advice to, you know, somebody in life who wanted to be successful now. That doesn't have to be limited to boxing. It can be in boxing, maybe young fighters, you're just starting out, just getting going. But it could also be, you know, anyone who wants to sort of uh, make something of themselves in life like you have, basically, you know. Yeah. What sort of advice would you give to them uh, in order to succeed? I know that's a bit of a, a bit of a strange one, but this is the motivational aspect now. Um, so what would you say to somebody who wants to, wants to make it in life, wants to do something with themselves? Well, I would say two things, right? Um... So much is given, much is required. That's like the biggest saying. And um, the other saying is, um, you know, um, no retreat, no surrender. You know, because it's a lot. It's a lot of things that we have to battle emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually inside our heads. Our head is like it could be, it could be, um, it could be a junk box, a junk mail. You know, or it could be a gift. So. It's the fun, the whole thing is like, my, my wife always tells me, tell me this, trust the process, you know? So, cause we don't have, we really not in too much control, right? I was reading in the Bible today and I always believed this before I even read this in the Bible that we have two ways that we can go in life. One is a, a long way, it's a detour and, you know, U-turns and this, then the other one's a straight way. And you gotta find your way. So in doing a career, a sports career, whether or, or a career in business, you have to find your way, you know? And sometimes you might have to do things that you're not probably willing to do, but, you know, but that's the difference between losers and winners. The difference between a loser and the difference between a winner is that a winner would do, be willing to do the things that losers won't do, right? So you got to be willing to just 
submit to submit to the process and you got to trust it. So I'm learning, I'm 49 years old now and I still, I'm still working every day at submitting and trusting the process. I feel like this is going to be the best half of my life. I've done so many travel 21 different I mean, I'm not even counting, you know, um, Caribbean islands. I've been around, around 50, 41 to 38 states. I've traveled. I've had, I had it all and I had nothing. But through all of that, you know, I persevered. Through all of that, I believe I'm a king. Through all of that, I stay, I kept, kept my humor and my dignity, you know, and I love people, you know. And the best thing you could do is, um, you know, love people, pass it on, and try to be a blessing to people. And I'm not perfect. I have a lot of things that I'm working on and that I'm working towards. But at the same time, my heart is in the right space, you know, and uh, my faith is growing every day stronger and stronger. So that's very, very, very important to me. I said before, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic insight and I, I love the self-improvement aspect of that. And, uh, and I really like, you know, how humble you are and, and how you sort of grown through these, you know, these different processes. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for putting that out there. Um, one other thing that I'd like to talk about um, here that, that you, you know, we sort of opened up a little bit there was the business side of things. Now I know that, um, you know, you've got your own event company, uh, and I know that's something you're doing at the moment, uh, that, you know, that's going very well. Again, you know, mentioned it a little bit on the phone uh, when we spoke before, but that's something I'd like to sort of um, throw out there, because as much as we've, we've talked a bit about some of what has happened and we sort of look back a bit, you know, I'd like to look forward a bit now, uh, a little bit, and sort of see um, what's going on there. So, so let's talk a little bit about your event company and, and what's, um, what's happening with that side of things, basically. Yeah, so Zab, myself, and my partner, Joe Murray, who's a, a defense lawyer who just ran for Queens District Attorney, we, uh, we have an event, called, event, event company called the Barrett VIP Group. And the Barrett VIP Group is a VIP a concierge, sports concierge service, where we give the ultimate experience of being in the, in the back, the, you know, in the behind the scenes with uh, being a boxer. So you get to, with Zab, myself, and other celebrities and other athletes like Kid Chocolate, Peter Quilling, you know, um, just uh, Curtis Stevens. I have a gang of people that I love and that I have personal relationships with, even Lamar Bruce, Brewster. So what, um, what we do was we, um, Layman, I don't know why I found Lamar, Lamar, Layman, I'm thinking about my other good friend. So layman. So what we do is we take you to the to the fights. What cost? We got we got VIP car service. Everything is VIP. VIP car service. We have the Sprinter trucks most of the time. Full service in the Sprinter trucks. Uh, we have dinner at the five star restaurants. We have meet and greets with, and where we get a chance to take pictures with the celebrities and the boxes. And uh, then also then we go off sit ringside. And we watch the fights and have a great time. It's like, you know, it's like a bro, a brohood, you know. But kids are welcome, women are welcome, and it's a it's a great it's a event, you know. We haven't taken any women lately and as as of yet, but we're looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well it's great work you're doing. I mean it's you know, it's a fantastic experience for people. Um and uh, you know, just on a personal note, I I really like what you're doing there. And I wanted to get that in there. Um as well now there's a couple of Zab, i will tell you i forgot to tell you zab and i we have so many stories in boxing so the guys love to hear our stories more than anything at dinner and we tell them the stories the guys love that because it's like this this is the 24 7 this is the connection because people don't get the chance to hear the stories about you know don king about lou DeBella, about this fighter about that fighter so when you expose those stories and tell those stories they'd be all in like wow for real i didn't even know that went on i said you know you just never know even in wall street i'm pretty sure you guys have an intense life you know absolutely well you know champ i mean i don't want to give too much away with this because obviously um if people want the full experience they should book with you right but Don King, I've got to ask you about that because it's funny you said that because I meant to ask earlier and I forgot, so I apologize for that. But Don King is, um, is one guy that I really wanted to ask you about because you've had dealings with him in the past and you mentioned a little bit about um, 
you know, the advice that he gave you and stuff. But what, what's it like working with him? Um, I mean, overall, what's, what's the actual experience? You know, what's he like as a person? Just any, anything you want to say about that, because um, that's like amazing. Don, yeah, yeah. Don is, he's, in, he's a, a, a whole subject within himself. But like he said, one thing I respect, I don't, I don't per se care for Don King, but I respect Don King. So sometimes you might not care for a person, but those, the way they move and what they have done in boxing, he, he's an icon. And, you know, like he said, um, um, how did he say? He said, just know one thing. I'm going to walk in the ring with the winner, and I'm going to walk out the ring with the winner. The best thing I can do for the loser is get with the winner. <laughs> so, you know, he lets you know, like, listen, you're, gonna, you're dealing with the devil, and it is what it is. But I respect that least he ain't coming to you. Because he didn't come to me like, oh, champ, I'm your best friend and calling me. Like, because I, 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 I don't want to name promoters, but promoters, it's promoters and managers that put the front on and they be all up in your face. But then as soon as you lose, they're kicking you to the curb. Don King realized you, when you lose, I am kicking you to the curb, but I'm telling you in front of your face that I'm kicking you to the curb, you know? And, um, you know, uh, he had said, you know, me and him was having an argument about around a Hasin Rockman fight because of, of the money. He was like, you know, he said, he, I'm going to say it the nice way, because it was, it was a lot of cursing and going back and forth. And he said, listen, he said, all you people coming here wanting all this money. He said, let me tell you something. He said, you never, you never get what you want. You, how do you say it? He said, um, you never get what you want. Uh, I had this thing so many, for so many years. I mean, since 2005. Oh, he said, you never get what you want, only what you negotiate. Life, life is a delicate negotiation. I said, mm, I, I, that stuck with me in 2005. I still remember it. You never get what you want, only what you negotiate. Negotiate. So when you look at life, everything from our marriage to our children, to our jobs, to the car we want, to the food we eat is a negotiation. And you never get what you want, only what you negotiate. You know, life is de it's a delicate negotiation. That was deep. And to this day, I still hold truth to that. Like, wow, life, look, I'm delegating with my wife about what we're going to eat, when we're going to do this, when we're going to do that. I'm delegating with my kids. You know, you got to be, you got to be one of the, you got to get to know what's going on with kids now. I got to delegate. I can't do things my way all the time. You know, so life is a delicate negotiation. You never get what you're worth, only what you negotiate. It's true. Mm. Yes, wise words. You know, wise words. I'll, I'll say that much. Um, and it's fascinating to hear. Again, it's fascinating to hear that, you know, that side of it, because, um, yeah. Now, that leads me to something else. Um, I mean, there's only, you know, a couple more questions that I have anyway. But that does lead me to something that, that I think is an interesting subject. I mean, you've learned a lot of lessons over your career and over your life by the sound of it um which is which is great because life is a learning experience at the end of the day but i mean out of like some of the lessons that you've taken from boxing what are some of the biggest ones because what i mean by this is that it strikes me that boxing has sort of made you a better person and you've you know and you've grown uh, as a person uh, and that's you know and you, you sort of describe that yourself so if there was like one, I mean, I'm sure there's lots and lots of things, but if there was like one or two um, of, the, of the main sort of life lessons that you've taken from, you know, from your victories, from your defeats, from, you know, your dealings with people, uh, anything like that, what would they be? Um, I mean, if I could, that's the first time that question has been, has been answered, asked, to, asked of me. So I would say, every, mm, I would to say, so one of my other sayings is well, everything that glitters is not always gold. So that comes from everything involved in the sport of boxing and in life. It's like, it's like, it's, it's like an oxymoron, you know, uh, it's the same, but it's the opposite. But I get a lot of, um, um, a lot of reality check from boxing. And then I apply it to my life. Like everything that like people think, Oh, you made a million dollars. No, by the time, Everybody took their chunks, and then by the time you pay taxes, it's no, it's three fifty, four hundred thousand. Everything that glitters is not always gold, you know. That's what that's my cliche. Just like you know, a lot of people see people win, but they don't see the hard work they put into it. Some people lose, and they don't see the hard work they put into it. Everything that glitters is not always gold. 
right? You might see an unfair uh, uh, um, calling it with the judges or the referee. Everything that glitters is not always gold. Some people have hidden agendas, you know? And so what I've learned in boxing is that everything that glitters is not always gold, you know? But it's all the way how you approach it, you know? And you can't, you can't be so losers in life, you know? And one thing Boston has taught me when I lost my first fight against uh, Lance Whitaker, I wanted to quit boxing for a quick day. But then I'm like, that's not me. I'm not a quitter. You know, so it's not about losing. And I think nowadays everybody's trying to break, break Floyd Mayweather record. Boxing is not about, um, not about being undefeated. It's about, it's about winning and being at your best. And if that makes you undefeated like a Mayweather, then so be it. Mayweather had way more discipline than any other fighter that I've known. I know Mayweather personally. I spent time with him uh, in Zab's training camp. And when he was fighting, Zab was going to fight Casa Azul. So every night for a week when we came to Vegas, Mayweather and Zab, we would all play basketball for like hours into like 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 or 4 in the morning. And this is on Vegas time. And then Mayweather, every day before we left the arena, I mean the basketball court, he would jump on the treadmill and run four miles. That was amazing to me. I didn't, it didn't hit, because this was 2001, I think, or 2002 when Zab fought Casa Azul. But just think about that. We played five or six games of uh, talking crap, you know, back and forth, games like an hour long, playing full court of basketball. And after four or five games a night, and after that, he would go on the treadmill and run his four miles. That's amazing that somebody would have that much discipline to, to do that. And that's why he's undefeated. That's why he is, you know, the GOAT in boxing because he worked for it. He believed in himself, and he stuck to his his regiment of, you know, go hard or go home. And while we was going home, he was going hard on the treadmill, right? And that's that's why he's O'Flay Mayweather. That's why he have accomplished the things he's accomplished because of him believing in himself and him trusting the process, point blank. It's amazing insight into it. That is uh, that is quite something. Um, I mean, again, you know, you don't always see that side of it. And it's like, even though um, I've met Mayweather actually one time, um, taking his photos at an event and stuff, and I've obviously followed his career um, for a long time. But again, you know, you don't hear that side of it. And I've heard stories like that, but, it, you know, unless you're sort of up close and, and personal for, for a longer time, you know, you don't see um, necessarily see the, the dedication in that way. So that, that's amazing. I mean, that is amazing. Um, there's only a couple more questions now, Champ, because I mean, we, you know, we've covered a lot. Um, one of the questions that, that I have is obviously looking back on your boxing career uh, and everything that you've accomplished um, and, you know, everything that you've achieved. I mean, how do you think that you're remembered as a fighter? Now, I know that I don't mean that to say like, oh, it's all over, like how you remember. I don't mean it like that at all. No, I, just, I, I just mean like in terms of just the fighting. How do you, um, you know, how do you think that, that people will remember you and how, and how do you want to be remembered as a fighter sort of as the years go on, basically? Well, white, life is a delicate negotiation. So how I want to be remembered and how I want and how I will be remembered are two different things. But how I will be remembered is like, um, you know, this Barrett, he fought his heart out. He didn't get a chance to be a world champion, but he was a champion. He won a couple of other belts, but... He has so much potential, and he always fell short. I know I fell short because I don't think, personally, being honest with myself, I had discipline. I needed, I didn't have the discipline that I needed to become world champion. Even though a lot of people don't understand, when I fought Hasim Rockman for the WBA, I mean for the WBC intern, uh, Don King gave him 350,000 tweets before the fight, and Carl King was his manager. So they had an investment in him. So I'm not saying a hot team round. I thought it was a fight. I thought the fight could have went either way, but it was. It made more sense for Don King to give Hasim Rockman a fight because he could have recouped his money. And what Rock, Rockman did was he took the money because he knew he wasn't going to be with King. And you know what he did right after the fight? Filed bankruptcy and won with Arrow. So that worked. Oh, so. You see how, and then he fought James Tony in Atlantic City. 
right? So you see how you know you you, you can't you can't do you can't do uh, bad and, and expect to get good, you know. So Don King was doing a negative thing by, or just let the best fighter fight, let them fight it out and figure out who's the best, the best fight instead of trying to control the situation. And so you know, a lot of people didn't know that. So um, back to your question is that just you know. I just look at I just look at it as like everything that glitters is not gold, you know. And you know, a lot of people don't understand the blood, sweat, and tears, and the sacrifices that you got to make to just fight. Forget about being champion, just to fight. You still got bills, you still got family, you still got you know responsibilities, you still got accountabilities, you still have all of those things that you got to uphold to, and then on top of that, you got to perform, and you know, nobody's crying over it because that's the life we choose. But you got to be the best at everything. You can't fall short on one thing because then you don't have a balance. And once your balance is, is broken, you, you're not, you know, most, more than likely it's not going to be good for you. You get it? Yeah, yeah, it makes complete sense to me. But it's, uh, it's amazing to hear it like that because you've, you know, you, you've lived and breathed this. So, um, so I appreciate you sharing. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you know, you, we've got to see the human side of of fighters because people don't see everything that goes on, everything that you guys go through. Not just fighters, but I mean, any athlete, you know, anyone who's who's in the public eye, you don't always see, um, you don't always see that. But that's an interesting insight into into you know how you um, think you will be remembered. Uh, I mean, to be honest, with everything you've achieved, champ. I mean, I hope. I'm just saying this is a bit off topic, but I mean, I hope you're you're satisfied with. Um, what you've achieved, but then at the end of the day, that's up to I, you. I was going to tell you, I got inducted to the Boxing Hall of Fame in New York, and then I just got an invite for the Boxing Hall of Fame in New Jersey. I think that the International Boxing Hall of Fame should have um, honorable mentions. Like, I think, like, uh, Alex Stewart. You remember Alex Stewart? Mm -hmm. I think, like, me and his fight career, like, somewhat same, like, similar. We were uh, top contenders we we got we won titles, but we never won a world title. But we fought everybody, you know, and and um, and we and we did it at at our you know at our best. But we should be honorable mention. They should have an honorable mention after this this, this um this quarantine is over, or this uh, coronavirus thing. I'm going to reach out for somebody in the international boxing and ask them about honorable mention because I think that you know. I think that should be it should be a title. It should be a title or, or division in the International Hall of Fame for honorable mention. Because I'm pretty sure if you go down the line, it's a lot of fans that have fighters that are not honorable, honorable mention in the International Boxing Hall of Fame that should be. Mm. Right? Yeah. And I know even some fighters that haven't like um haven't even been in the Hall of Fame, like Hasim Rockman, he's he's not He's not. Um, he's not in the. Uh, he won't go in the Hall of Fame of Bo International Hall of Fame of Boxing, but he went into Las Vegas Hall of Fame of Boxing. You know, so you know it all. It all depends. But I feel. I feel like there should be some honorable mentions. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. There should be. Um, Layman Brewster. Layman yeah. Brewster. He should be honorable mention, right? I mean, he he was a he was a he. I don't think he. I don't think he would make it to the International Hall of Fame, but I think he should be honorable mention, mm. right? Right. So you got a lot of fighters that will, should be honorable mention. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you get a chance to talk to him about that, champ. I mean, that would be some some good work if you could have a chat with him about it, because it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I. Funny enough, I've said the same thing before, actually. Um, but it's funny how they don't do that. So it's uh, it's it's something that you've sort of come out with that because that, it's a very very good idea and it's. It's the right thing to do, really. I mean, it's, there's no other way to um, put it. You know, I mean, it, it is the right way to do things. So, fingers crossed on that one. Um, and that does lead me to, you know, the last question that I have, really. Um, you know, the last one is basically future plans. I mean, it's basically, you know, where you're going from here. And I know we've talked about the event company, um, VIP events. And I know we, you know, we've we've talked about this Hall of Fame. So we've sort of touched on it a few things. But you know, over the next sort of next few years now, or even perhaps sooner in time, you know, after this quarantine's done and dusted. What are your future ambitions? I mean, what's, what's sort of driving you now? 
Well, what's driving me is my family, my desire to win, my desire to be a better person, my desire to, to serve God and be the best version of me. You know, Zab and myself, uh, we have um, a TV show that we involved with called The Boxer Wives. We're also working on a show that we're going to start shooting in, next, in the next couple of months after this coronavirus is over. And uh, we're, him and I shooting our own show together. And, um, you know, uh, you know, the Bad VIP group is like my, my baby at this point in time. So, you know, I was, I was, I don't really, I like commentary, but I don't think that that's like, that's the end all be all for me. So just basically easy, you know, less is more for me. You know, at this, at this age and stage of my life, you know, I don't travel, I don't been around. You know, all I do is want to make money, take care of my family, live a quiet, good life, you know, don't have to knock nobody out. And, you know, just, just, you know, stay in my lane. It's never crowded when you stay in your own lane. So that's where I am. So, I mean, last thing there is, before we wrap this up, I mean, you know, we've covered and some amazing stuff um, here. And what's cool about it is some of the questions I've had, you, you know, you answered without me asking them. So, you know, it's, but it's, it's been fantastic, it's been enjoyable. Anything that you want to say to the fans, to anyone uh, who's going to watch this, who's watching this, um, any final words, anything you're sort of holding on to that you want to put out there? If you're all good, that's cool. But I'm just opening that up in case there's anything you want to say to anyone. Yes, definitely. I want to say thank you to all the boxing fans that have supported boxing, that support me and who have believed in me in some part of my career. I thank you for that. I also uh, ask you to go look on my website, Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T, V-I-P group uh, dot com and um, click on. And if you ever want to go to an event, a boxing event or any sporting event, just get in contact with us by email or information or text or a phone call at the office. Everything is there on a, online and it explains everything in detail what Zab, myself and Joe Murray are doing. So just about, you know, I'm, I'm grateful of this platform. I'm grateful of the opportunity to be on, on, on your show and just to speak about boxing, whether we got one viewers or a million viewers, boxing is, a, is one of the best sports in the world. It's the most, you know, it's the hard sport and it's the most combatable sport when you have to try to kill somebody and then shake their hand and, get, and be, a, be their friend and thank them for their services, you know? So it's an amazing opportunity that I got to, you know, be on that platform. And I'm grateful that I came out in one and a half piece. You know, I still got all my teeth, you know. I still can speak from here to there. So I'm grateful. Well, Champ, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I, you know, I'm very, very grateful for you um, taking the time to talk with me. I'm very, very grateful for you, um, you know, being so sort of open with me. And I know that that's the person that you are. But still, I'm grateful for you sharing um, you know, as much as you have um, with me and with everyone watching this. So, um, so thank you very, very much, you know, for your time with that. All right. Thank you, Lena. And listen, take care, man. Stay, you know, stay sucker free from all these, these coronavirus, <laughs> coronavirus people, you know, and get yeah. yourself to stay, stay, stay blessed, man. I appreciate I you. And you, and you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.